We on? I will call this public hearing to order. Ms. Malfors, will you please take the roll? President Spear? Here. Vice President Osborne? Here. Member Gresham? Here. Here. Member Causey? Here. All are present. There's a quorum. Thank you very much. Moving on to 1.3, public hearing on 2021 to 2022 K-8 remote learning. Dr. Baca. Thank you, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team. As you know, we have already presented and approved our Arizona online instruction, our Madison Virtual Academy. Um, but uh, after that, House Bill 2862 gave us flexibility to expand that and be able to uh, expand more of the instructional time and how we utilize that. And so tonight I'm here to uh, talk to you about that in just a moment in terms of how we've expanded it to our uh, kindergarten, first and second grade classrooms. So it allows us to be able to uh, modify the instructional hour requirements so that we're able to provide students with uh, remote access to learning. This allows us to follow a hybrid model where some students are learning in person while other students are learning remotely from home. So as we do that and as uh, the House Bill requires that we have two public hearings, this is the first of, of two. So to be considered a full time and generate uh, full funding, students must, be enro students must be enrolled and follow minimum number of instructional hours. And you see it there for you. Uh, for fourth through eighth grade, that's 890 hours. First through third, 712 hours. And for kindergarten students, 356 because we only receive funding for half day kindergarten. So for this school year, we may provide up to 50% of total instruction. Uh, timed in a remote setting. This is going to really help, especially as we're going to be facing quarantining, that we're able to, and I've already asked in, in a future presentation that I give tonight, we'll explain a little bit more of what I've asked the principals to prepare teachers for and students and, and the families. So we're able to do that without any impact of funding. And uh, for instructional time provided over the threshold, they'll calculate additional time at 95% of the base support level. So um, our remote learning in K-2 program is designed for students to learn through uh, a substantial or high transmission of COVID transmission rates or until a vaccine is available for those under 12. We, um, after tonight's approval, but we already have hired our kindergarten, first and second grade remote learners and they came yesterday to pick up their uh, packets and Chromebooks along with our Madison Virtual Academy um, students. So. It will meet the re, um, minimum uh, number of instructional hours that are required by the state. And it will follow our adopted curricula. It will utilize our instructional materials and be taught by a Madison teacher. So uh, third through eighth grade, it's gonna be the same instructional uh, day as the brick and mortar schools for kindergarten. Um, they'll focus in on ELA, ELA math and science and it's a half day program. We wanna be um, very sensitive to the fact that uh, of students and, and how much they can take in terms of online instruction. And I think our remote teachers are going to be very flexible in being able to uh, modify anything that's needed while um, meeting those instructional hours. So first through second grade, we'll focus in on the ELA math, science, and social study content areas as well. And that will be from 7.45 un until 1 p.m. And so um, that concludes the presentation because uh, you've discussed this before with Madison Virtual Academy and so forth. So I'll be happy to entertain any questions. And if it's related to funding, um, Ms. Garvey, our deputy superintendent, will be able to respond to that as well. Are there any questions from board members? Dr. Osborne. Um, can you just give us a quick update on the enrollment on just the, the K-2 program and the uh, yeah, the other parts mm -hmm. of the, Dr. Osborne, uh, Madam President, members of the board and executive team, I will be presenting that when we talk about the data dashboards, metrics, and so forth. Are there any other questions from board members? Just a quick question. Um, traditionally, Madison provides more instructional hours than the minimum. Um, is it through this program, are we providing just the minimum or are we doing the additional that we normally do 
uh, for other students as well, and, and uh, just how is that being dealt with? Sure, Mr. Holcomb, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team, if we were just to always have the remote learning throughout the year, we would meet the minimum and a little bit above. But because we anticipate that these families per quarter will, especially if transmission levels um, are minimum um, or moderate, that they would choose to return back to um, the brick and mortar schools, which would mean go above the instructional hours. Ms. Kazi. I just have a really quick question on specifically kinder, but given the limited number of hours, I assume that is predominantly synchronous learning as opposed to asynchronous. Is that a fair assumption? Sure, Ms. Kazi, uh, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team. For that, I'm going to defer over to Ms. Marshall. She's been working with her team a little bit more in terms of those details. So, Ms. Marshall. Thank you, Dr. Baca and Governing Board members. Uh, for our K-2, it will be a lot of uh, synchronous time. Now, we are going to build up to that. We did inform parents because of that concern with screen time for our younger students. So there will be a build up. Uh, to that, but there is that dedicated time within that schedule that will be uh, with a teacher, especially because of the reading skills at a developmental age. Um, and then for our 3 8 program, uh, it's a combination of synchronous and asynchronous depending on the subject area. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we will adjourn this public hearing. Anyone to speak? No, no public. There were no. There were no. There are, there are no public vote. comments with regards to the public hearing. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. The public hearing is adjourned. We are starting our regular meeting. I will call this meeting to order. We will start with the pledge of allegiance. Ms. Rodriguez, will you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will accept a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Ms. Kazi, seconded by Ms. Gresham. Please vote. For those of you who are watching, sometimes there's a lag in our system. So it's not like we're pondering whether to adopt the agenda. That motion passes. Moving on to communications and announcements. 3.1, superintendent report, Dr. Baca. Thank you, Madam President, members of the governing board and executive team. First of all, welcome to our public that's uh, with us tonight. Uh, we'd love to have our parents engaged and here with us uh, to listen to the discussion and, and to be able to participate. As you know, it was the first day of school. I plan on giving some of those details uh, w with my presentation that's coming um, under 7.1, uh, including enrollment updates and so forth. There's always hiccups on the first day. So yes, we did have that lost child. Yes, we did have that child who missed a bus. And yes, we had traffic issues. Um, but we know that as the days pass, uh, they will continue to improve and get better. But um, I'll be able to provide more details uh, later on. So thank you. Thank you. Moving on to governor, uh, governing board member reports. I will start on my right. Ms. Kazi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of the families that put our trust in us and our students for this um, school year. I, I have a very dear friend from college who is a school administrator in Georgia, and she said that she starts this year um, with, it, it's just the most challenging year she's ever experienced in her whole life. and it, um, and I, I, I imagine that we have some administrators and, and teachers that feel the same way today. Um, I think that starting on a Tuesday instead of a Monday, um, giving teachers and administrators a little more time to get ready was certainly a blessing. So I just want to say, I have a little bit a short prepared thing to say, that even in hard times, what we do is a blessing. We hold the future in our hands. We love and nurture kids, helping them grow, and along the way, helping them reach their full potential and become the adults that will change our world. I wish that despite the significant challenges you face this year, that you will still find joy in the amazing work we do. So again, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Osborne. Well, I can't top that, so I have nothing to report. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Ms. Gresham. Thank you. I just want to welcome everyone back. Um, it was nice to see 
All the familiar faces, I was briefly at number one this morning, dropping my kids off. Um, they're happy to be back. And um, I want to remind everyone, too, about the free meals that we're continuing all this um, next school year. So to take advantage of that. And um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Holcomb. Yes, thank you. Um, just a couple quick things. I'm very happy that we're back in school, that in, in, in part. Um, and I uh, can't express en enough my appreciation for our community. Um, the, what's been going on outside the, po the politics and that too, and I have been exceedingly happy with the n nature and the tone and the, th of the discourse that we've had. And it is very uplifting. And while this is going to be a challenging year, I'm very excited about starting it. I mean, we have the challenges. We've really lifted up to it. There's a, these challenges give us opportunities. We're just already seeing the first one in the, the uh, Madison Online Academy and how that's really, really uh, taking uh, in addition to our, that we've been able to add. So um, I welcome, you know, it's unfortunate we have the challenge, but I welcome it and I'm looking forward to an exciting year. Thank you. I do not have much of a report except to say thank you to everyone for their cooperation Excuse me, on the first day of school and best wishes to all staff and students and families for a lovely year, all of the challenges notwithstanding. There's been no request for an executive session, so we are going to move on to calls to the public 5.1. Dr. Baca, do you want to uh, explain what the three-minute rule is or would you like me to? Um, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team, I do believe all the calls to the public are in relation to 7.1, so I don't know if you want to take them during the uh, call to the public that deals with items outside of the agenda, or if you wish to um, proceed with uh, it at this time. All of the calls to the public are with regards to 7.1, and I think that it would be appropriate for us to hear them now so that you may possibly be able to uh, hear what they have to say and then address some of the concerns that they may bring up sure. in your report. So Does as that part of feel is that good? Of course. Okay. As part of governing board policy that uh, you have set, there's a three minute uh, per comment section. For those of you who may be speaking for the first time, you have a little there by Miss Marshall, a counter that lets you know how many minutes you have. Uh, to speak and how many, much time you have left. At that time, the board president has the discretion to either allow you to continue or to thank you and ask you to close uh, your thoughts. And I will allow about five to 10 seconds after for you to wrap up your comments, but in, an order, in order to be consistent and fair from board meeting to board meeting, that is how I'm going to roll with this this evening. That said, I'm gonna call Jeremy Feldman. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to uh, present. It was a uh, privilege to uh, present uh, last year through the, uh, the first phase of this crisis. So the Madison School Board has done an admirable, admirable job listening to the experts and letting science dictate the best path forward. The board effectively balanced the diverse needs of their students and staff. As we start this coming year, the science tells us unequivocally that mask mandates are essential to keeping our students and staff safe. Unfortunately, Governor Ducey has inserted politics into public health and is trying to handcuff the state schools. Courage is having the inner fortitude to stand up to power when power is wrong and unjust. We learned from history that following orders is not a reasonable defense. It was not acceptable at Nuremberg. And today we must again decide that a law that clearly jeopardizes the health and welfare of our students and staff is a law that can't be followed. Have courage and protect us from our own government that seeks to sacrifice us on the altar of politics. My team and I have cared for more than 6,000 patients with COVID over the past 18 months. The hospitals are again filling up with critically ill patients. Vaccination is a critical measure, but so is masking. Unfortunately, vaccination remains out of reach for many of our children, making masking even more crucial. An additional benefit of mandatory masking is the ability to limit quarantining an entire class when a single student tests positive. Ample data now shows that this is not necessary. Implementation of a cohorting system within classes further protects our students' ability to stay in school. I implore the board to mandate masks and to continue with mask mandates. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next individual is Raina Patel.
Good evening, board members, parents, and friends. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I am the mother of two children, a second and fourth grader at Madison Heights. I am also a pediatric hospitalist, which means I'm a board certified pediatrician who works in the children's hospital. As a pediatric hospitalist, I've spent the last year and a half taking care of hospitalized children with COVID-19. Just this week, I admitted a healthy child for difficulty breathing. I stood by her in my gown and goggles and mask and watched as she tried to answer my questions, taking large pauses and gasping for air after each sentence. Is this how you've been breathing? And I asked her. Yes, she said. I haven't been able to sleep all week because I can't lay flat and I keep getting up to cough and gasp for air. The x-rays of her lungs were filled with pneumonia due to COVID-19. I know many people say, but the kids don't get as sick. And even if they get COVID-19, they're fine. Really? Over 400 children have died, according to the CDC website. That's 400 too many for me. The numbers of COVID positivity in children have dramatically increased in the last several weeks, both in Arizona and nationally. I could give you statistics and numbers, but are they really necessary? If it is your son in the hospital on dialysis because his kidneys are failing due to COVID-19, which I have seen, do statistics matter? If it is your daughter in the hospital on the maximum amount of oxygen, about to get a breathing tube down her trachea and get hooked up to a ventilator because of COVID-19 pneumonia, do statistics matter? I will answer that question for you. They do not matter when it is your own child. It is my duty as a mother to protect my own children, but I took an oath as a pediatrician to protect all of our children. Help me keep this oath. Keep universal masking mandatory. Parents can only opt out of mandatory masking with a note from their child's pediatrician due to approved medical reasons. A note from a parent stating they simply do not want to wear, want their child to wear a mask does not qualify as a reason to opt out. Why? Because masking works best to protect our community if everyone is masked in the classroom. Every day I speak to families and they tell me, I don't want to live in fear. And I say, I'm not asking you to live in fear. I'm asking you to live with kindness, with compassion, and with your community. It is your right and duty to choose to be a good role model and parent and teach your children how how to protect their friends by wearing a mask. It is also the right of all of our students to study safely in school and the right of our teachers to teach safely in school. Many parents say people are afraid, let them do virtual school, but friends, that is not the answer. If we have the option to safely keep kids in school with masks, then that is the best answer and should be our goal. Board members, I commend you for making the correct choice of making masks universally required in our schools. Over 700 parents who signed our petition for universal masking in the Madison School District have your back. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rachel Dethridge. Superintendent Baca and Governing Board. I'm also a parent of two Madison students and a community physician. I care deeply about the health and the well-being of our Madison families and our right to safe public schools. Universal masking in our schools during this pandemic is not only recommended by the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and nearly every other respected healthcare entity, it makes common sense and it's in line with our Madison core traits. Universal masking is critical in light of the highly infectious Delta variant, which is approximately three to five times more infectious than the original virus, depending on who you quote. Each individual is going to infect more people and children are more susceptible than ever before. Some will be hospitalized and others will suffer long COVID and still others will suffer from MISC. A rare amount will die and it's going to be higher than before and any child death is unacceptable. Thankfully, Delta's impact in our schools can be limited, although not eliminated, by the use of universal masking, meticulous quarantine, and testing. While there's some protection for the wearer, the wearer really does protect others. In the simplest terms, my mask protects you and your mask protects me. One case of unmasked Delta in a room will release far more particles than before, and it will put others in direct danger. The idea that our individual decisions not to mask are, are not going to affect others is really not based in the reality of this disease. Universal masking does show caring and respect for our Madison community and it will maintain just a minimally safe environment where we're less likely to be interrupted by illness, by quarantines, by school closures. 
And I applaud and I thank you for rightly seeing that the Arizona budget bill prohibiting masks is not yet in effect. Thank you for putting in this life-saving measure. I highly recommend that the CDC guidelines be, fall, be followed strictly for each mask waiver. None of this is theoretical. This is already happening in our country, in our state, and in our Madison schools. The growing list of Arizona school outbreaks is worsened by the lack of universal masking in other schools, lack of true quarantine, and lack of testing. Until the FDA can fully approve the COVID vaccine for all ages and people can make that choice, universal masking should be required in public schools as the most effective non-vaccine tool against COVID-19. So I implore, plead, beg with you, follow the simple, straightforward medical advice to universally mask at schools without exceptions according to the CDC guidance. We either are actively protecting or we are endangering. There's really no hedging, even if we want there to be. If anyone has health concerns about masking, please speak with your personal physician. It's been extensively researched and personally tested every day for over a year and a half by myself, every other medical professional here, really in the world, and our own children. So thank you so much for your time, your efforts, and care for this public institution. Thank you. Dr. Ruth Frank Snedeker. Dr. Baca and the Madison District Governing Board, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to address you. My name is Dr. Ruth Frank Snedeker. I'm a hospital physician, meaning that I have been taking care of hospitalized COVID patients since March of 2020. I come to you today to be sure that the Governing Board is informed of how the Delta variant of COVID has changed the game. Greater than 83% of cases are currently the Delta variant in the US and this number continues to climb. For every one person, the original COVID strain would infect one to two others. For the Delta variant, this number is ranging from six to 10. Delta is massively more infectious and proving to be more infectious among children as well. The Delta variant is 200% more transmissible and results in a thousand times higher viral load in the infected individual. Viral load also correlates to the severity of illness. People who are vaccinated or who have had COVID before will not get as sick, but can still contract and spread the Delta variant. Before Delta came on the scene, this would not have really been the case but it is the situation now. Vaccinated individuals have the same amount of virus in their body as unvaccinated individuals and are contagious for nine days versus the 16 days that an unvaccinated individual is commonly on average um, contagious. So yes, you can still be vaccinated to get the Delta variant COVID and infect 10 people around you completely asymptomatically. The vaccine protects you 84% of the time from serious illness and hospitalization. This is at six months post vaccine, which is where all the teachers and healthcare workers currently stand. This is down from 95%. But that data was not for the Delta variant. The emerging information about the vaccine and the Delta variant is that it's less effective preventing you from contracting the disease, but it remains extensively, extremely protective against hospitalization and death. Again, the vaccinated can contract Delta variant COVID-19 and spread it. Only 39% of the 16 to 17 year olds in this country and 27% of the 12 to 15 year olds in this country are fully vaccinated. Study after study shows the effectiveness of a layered approach for mitigation in K through 12 schools. Unmasked children and faculty promote the spread of COVID-19. This has been proven over and over in the data and that was even before the Delta variant came on the scene. I recognize that my comments will alienate many people and to be quite frank, at the start of the fourth wave, I am beyond caring. Why do we continue to punish those children and parents that are diligently working to keep schools open by promoting evidence-based mitigation measures that works? I'm tired of sacrificing the health and safety of education of my children for people that truly do not understand the complexity of this virus and have politicized public health. I understand that my utopian desires of having everyone care about their community is a pipe dream. I want everyone at school to wear a piece of cloth over your nose and mouth for a little while. I want you to teach and expect your kids to do it too so that I can continue to treat suffering and death and stop spending countless hours away from my family caring for yours. Take it from this hospital physician who despite working every day with COVID patients for the past 18 months, masking works. I've managed to keep my family safe only to have it likely undone on the first day of school as my child was seated next to an unmasked child today. Please let children learn in the best place for them to receive an education in school and continue to mandate masking and what other mitigation methods we can for the health and safety of students and faculty. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Ritchie. Mm. 
<sighs> Dr. Baca, members of the governing board, my name is Kathy Ritchie and I am the mother of a Madison second grader. My fellow parent, Beth Kohler, is the mother of a first and eighth grader. Beth could not be here tonight, so I'll be reading our joint statement. Thank you for your service to the district and our children over these past 18 months. We'd also like to thank you for making the decision to reinstate a mask mandate at all Madison schools. We believe this is our best shot to remain in person for as long as possible. According to Maricopa County Health data, schools that started earlier than us are already experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks. Besides multiple outbreaks, at least two schools have either shifted to online learning or closed as a result of active COVID cases. At this point, we have no intention of appealing to anyone's better nature. We want to talk facts and logistics about what the continued spread of COVID-19 will mean for schools this year. As many parents know, there is no online option if our children are exposed and forced to quarantine. I was told that students who are sent home will be given provided work. We think this is very important to highlight because unlike last year where children were able to pivot and join online classes, that will not be the case this year. For example, Beth's children were quarantined and or isolated on multiple instances last year, totaling for about five weeks of, out of in-person learning. Fortunately, they were able to receive online instruction. Parents will once again have to take time off work to support their students. Often, that caregiving burden falls on working mothers. In addition, if teachers are exposed and unable to teach in person, we don't have a deep bench of substitutes who are able or willing to take their place in order to keep our kids in class. I recall this board asking parents to to asking parents service substitutes. I wonder how many answered that call because we're probably going to need them. Needless to say, we are very confused as to why parents would potentially risk a several day quarantine given their concerns in late 2020, early 2021 about online early. Former Arizona Republic reporter Lily Altavina wrote this last November following a Madison board meeting, quote, a middle school student told the board he learns better with his friends nearby. A father said his daughters fall behind academically in isolation. A mother lamented that her daughter became withdrawn while learning in front of a computer screen. This time there will be no online learning. There will be provided work. We believe children will experience those same feelings of loneliness, isolation, and anxiety, anxiety if they're quarantined at home. We believe that without proper mitigation strategies like masking, the potential for learning loss could be even greater, especially if teachers and students are going in and out of quarantine for days at a time. We realize masking is not 100% perfect, but our public health and physician communities are telling us masking is safe and effective. While some parents have compared COVID-19 to the flu, we do not have enough data about the long-term impacts on the lungs, the heart, or the brain. But even if kids are low risk, we point you back to the learning disruption that will occur possibly more than once with uncontained transmission in our schools. This is not a political issue. We want all our children in school for the entire school year. Masking is one of the best ways to make that happen. So please, parents, be part of the solution. Board members, thank you for doing the right thing. We know you have faced tremendous pressure for some parents and we're grateful. And teachers, thank you for everything you do. We know these past 18 months have been incredibly difficult and you deserve to be safe at work and we support you and appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Shauna Yoder. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm a parent of two children who attend Madison Heights and Madison number one. I'm grateful that the board has followed scientific evidence and instituted the mask mandate. I'm requesting tonight that you limit the opt out option to those with medical conditions that a mask would compromise. Despite the different opinions in the community, there are two things I'm pretty certain everyone can agree on. Number one, for the vast majority of our students, faculty and staff, in person school is superior to virtual school. Number two, Every student in the district is equally entitled to safe access to in-person learning. I want to briefly tell you about my children. One of my children has asthma. The other child was born with a life-threatening allergy to dairy. Ingestion of dairy led to anaphylaxis, use of an EpiPen, and the hospital. Thanks to a life-changing course of oral immunotherapy, my child can now eat dairy without fear of a reaction as long as I drink a certain amount of milk every day. To consume that milk, they have to be feeling healthy, no colds or upset stomachs, etc. If this child were to contact COVID, they would likely be asymptomatic at first. Then they would take their milk, their daily milk dose, and they would have an anaphylactic reaction. As most of us probably know, anaphylaxis can be fatal. So simply put, my child could die from COVID. Children with so-called super strength immune systems are not better than children with compromised immune systems. 
Children with these super strength immune systems are not inherently more deserving of a safe, quality, in-person learning environment than other children. No family should have to worry about their child getting very sick or dying from going to school because someone else doesn't want to put a piece of cloth over their nose and mouth. All children's lives are more important than the minor inconvenience that a mask imposes. I should not have to keep my child out of school because others won't wear masks. COVID can kill, but no one ever died from wearing a mask. Please continue the mask mandate and limit the opt-out option to require a physician's signature. Thank you. Thank you. Nicholas Huggins. Thank you for letting me talk today. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and intensive care physician, as well as a parent of a student at Madison Heights Elementary. I want to emphasize my support and the support of the medical community for universal masking in schools, per the recommendations of the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics. While kids may not be at the highest risk group for complications from COVID, I can personally attest to seeing otherwise healthy children present with severe disease. I mainly work in the cardiac intensive care unit, but I've taken care of children in the COVID unit in the COVID ICU with acute disease. This sometimes takes the form of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, otherwise known as MISC, which often causes a profound cardiogenic shock state. These children present with extremely low blood, blood pressures and decreased perfusion to their organs. They require medicines to artificially raise their blood pressures and may require intubation to take over the work of the lungs. Without medical intervention, if the state continues, it can lead to organ failure and death. We are at a high census level, which means we already have patients waiting in our ED for beds. The place that I work at, I am on service today. I spent an hour and a half discussing beds because we have other patients that we have to move around because we are at such a high census level. That's an hour and a half. I cannot take care of critically ill children. Adults and children 12 and over have not yet been given the opportunity to be vaccinated. However, elementary age children are not yet el eligible to receive the vaccine. Until our kids can be vaccinated, we need to do everything we can to mitigate spread in the face of the surge in uh, cases of the Delta variant. With masking last year, we were able to minimize interruptions of in-person learning. It has been proven over and over again that if we all wear masks, we reduce the spread of COVID with no physical risk. Thank you for making the right decision to sustain our masking efforts to help us pr uh, protect our children. Thank you. Anais Sonder. Did I get that right? Anias. Anias, thank you. Like on ice, so thank that's you. Okay. Um, good evening, Dr. Baca and the governing board. Um, my name is Dr. Ania Sonder. I trained in internal medicine and spent most of my spending most of my career in primary care, although I'm not doing that right now. I want to start by just telling you my sincere appreciation for the courage and the conviction that you all have shown in doing everything in your power to protect our children during this difficult time. Um, my esteemed colleagues and other speakers have spoke at length about masking and the benefits of that and how uh, professional organizations involved in public health have all been promoting this. So what I just wanted to focus on briefly was COVID-19 or coronavirus has only been in the human population for two years or even a little less. We don't know the long-term effects. This is not the flu that's been around for hundreds of years. We don't know much about long COVID in children. We need to do everything we can to protect our children, not only to provide an effective learning environment, but a safe one. Every child deserves to be in school protected as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Heather Susong. Hello, thank you. Um, when people disagree, we must ask questions to understand what matters. And these are my questions. Universal masking allows all students to thrive and to be safe. Schools must accommodate children with different medical needs and risks. How will the schools respond when a child exposed to others who do not follow these precautions becomes sick, hospitalized, or disabled? All experts agree that mask precautions makes schools safer. 
Students long to be in school, at least my children do. At home is not an option for them. Why must the district place its community at risk because of the wishes of so few families? Our schools teach students to work in teams and to think about how their actions affect others. When the schools allow students and staff to ignore a mask mandate through a waiver, what message do we send? Why are some given this exception, this exemption? Are we using <clears throat> this event to teach students to model ethics, to model responsibility, care for one's community? As parents, we are informed when a child in class has a food allergy, we are expected to change our actions to keep that child safe, and we do it. For families seeking a mask exemption, what will they be told about <clears throat> expectations to keep others safe? Will we as parents <clears throat> be told when a child in a class has been given a mass, mask exemption? And how many per class? When a child in that class becomes sick or disabled, will the family who sought that waiver be aware of any moral or financial liability for that outcome? Tempe schools have called for the mask ban to be <clears throat> overturned. Will Madison join them? This board can require masks in this meeting. Do our children deserve the same? On a personal note, I mention disability in this a lot. It's because I am an occupational therapist. I, can, I work in acute care and I work with adults. Okay, no one will tell you their time they spent with an occupational therapist. They'll tell you about their physical therapy, but they won't tell you about OT. And that's because I am the therapist that works with people on feeding themselves, on wiping themselves after toileting. I'm the one who drags in the special equipment so we can get them out of the bed so that they can have their bowel movement on a regular potty. No one will tell you what we do because it's embarrassing. So I want you guys to think about that as you allow these families to go with waivers and how, how disability will affect our community. Thank you. Thank you. Raquel Mamani. Oh. Good evening, uh, Dr. Baca, Madam President, members of the board and executive team. My name is Raquel Mamani. Many of you know me because of the different hats that I wear. Today I'm here and always as a mom. I have two uh, kids in eighth grade at number one. But I'm also here as a substitute teacher. I started subbing years ago um, at the schools my children have attended as a way to use my 12 years of teaching experience to help support the teachers and schools in my community. We can all imagine what happens when a teacher has to be out and there's no substitute. It stresses the entire school. I want to continue to show up and support our Madison schools when needed, but I also deserve to feel as safe as possible um, in the classroom, as well as my children deserve to be in the safest classrooms possible. Please continue to require masks and make it <laughs> difficult to opt out. If everyone is opting out, kids are moving around classrooms. There is no way to separate the ones that have opted out from the ones that have not. I was in the classroom today. Um, I want to also thank you for your courage and for what you're doing. I know it's been a very difficult year. Um, and I just want to continue to remind you that the staff and students of the schools that you care for deserve to be protected to the highest level with masks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jose Urdaneta. Can you tell me how badly I, I messed up on your name? Actually, it was better than I usually pronounce it. <laughs> it, was, it worked out very well. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Uh, thank you all for, for um, allowing us to speak and uh, obviously for allowing me to speak. I, um, 
I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, and I work with uh, transplant patients at St. Joseph's Hospital uh, here in town. One of the biggest transplant programs in the country, uh, uh, lung transplant programs. Yeah, are, thank you. One of the uh, biggest lung transplant po programs in the country is here at St. Joseph's. Um, and I do the psychiatric support for them. I'm also a father, um, have three children, one of whom attends Madison Heights. Um, I'd like to add my voice to the multiple voices here um, asking for a mandate on indoor masks for teachers and for students in our public schools. Um, I understand the difficulty uh, in considering this and, and I thank you for considering it. However, I cannot overlook my day-to-day -day, uh, experience uh, since this pandemic started. Uh, and uh, that we all have experienced in, in our community. I uh, have attended to many young and otherwise healthy people who have suffered catastrophic ramifications to COVID-19. Death has been the ultimate prize for many, but others have uh, been able to receive lung transplants at the center that I work for. Uh, while this is perhaps miraculous in many ways, it is a drastic, uh, I don't know that a solution is the good word, uh, it's a drastic option for the alternative. Um, I believe um, that simple mitigation techniques, I don't need to uh, repeat the, the numerous voices that have already spoken about the numerous mitigation uh, techniques that work for uh, limiting the spread of COVID-19. I have been exposed to COVID-19, not like many of my colleagues here, but it's because of this thing on my face that I have not become infected. Otherwise, I'm, I'm sure I would have. We continue to wear masks uh, daily uh, in the hospital, even though the majority of us are vaccinated. And that's to protect ourselves, but to protect, more importantly, the vulnerable who we take care of. Uh, the Delta variant we've spoken about too. Uh, it is uh, up and running and much more transmissible and, and likely uh, more virulent. Like I said, I'm, I'm vaccinated now and I have some peace of mind that I am unlikely to become severely ill with this virus. My eight-year-old daughter is not yet able to receive a vaccine, nor are my two five-year-olds. For her safety, and not only for her safety, but for the teachers that teach her and the other staff, multiple staff members that come in, in contact with our children, masks work and they protect our children and they protect those who teach them. Life is too precious and I would rather trade the discomfort and perhaps inconvenience of masking for the potential to diminish morbidity and or mortality in our students and our teachers and staff. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Michonne Dietrich. Hi, thank you for having us tonight. I'm a parent of a kindergartner. And a Ms. Dietrich, grader. could you please um, pull the microphone Sorry. to all the future speakers? It is hard for our live stream, for our YouTube, to hear unless you're speaking directly into the microphone, which I know feels uh, odd for those who are not Sorry. used to this. So thank you so much. Hi, I'm a parent to so a kindergartner and a second grade student. And aside from all of this, it took me forever to select a school, so I'm super pumped that they're here. Very excited about that. I wanted to say thank you so far for requiring masks, and I know it's not an easy thing to do, especially with mandates that are out there and the uncomfortableness that certain people put into the room. Um, I didn't prepare anything, so I, and I'm nervous. Um, but standing on the shoulders of my physicians, I work at the same hospital as many of them. We are very busy right now. It's very hard work right now, and it's difficult working in pediatrics. These small humans are our future. They're everything. If all we can do to protect these children who can't get vaccinated is wear a mask, we need to do that. 
That's all we have. That is our only tool, and it's pennies. I'm not asking anybody to get vaccinated. I'm not asking anybody vaccinated, sorry. That's a personal choice. I understand people have their own reasons for not doing it. Masks are not going to hurt anybody. They will save lives. Thank you. Thank you. Tara Lathrop. Hello, uh, members of the governing board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I am a parent of um, two children who have attended Madison schools for the last 10 years. And there's not much more that I can say that hasn't been said already by our medical experts and other parents. But um, two things that I wanted to communicate is thank you to this board for making a very brave decision to um, follow public health guidance and make the decision to put in a mask mandate. And I would ask that you take that a step further and require a physician's uh, approval in order to grant an opt out. I'm already hearing reports that approximately 50% of the students are not wearing masks. And as many have said, we need them all to be wearing masks. Um, so thank you for that. But also, I would like to appeal to my fellow parents who are worried about their children and worried about the impact of wearing a mask and possibly having this be normalized and people getting used to never seeing each other's faces again. And, you know, I don't, I don't take that lightly. Um, like probably every single person in this room, I want things to be normal again too. I would love for my children to be able to visit my relatives who are battling cancer and are immune compromised because of their cancer treatments. I want to hold babies. <laughs> I feel like now I can't ask somebody to hold their baby because I don't want to put that baby at risk. And I want to watch my children do their performances in person, not on a Zoom meeting. And I really would like to take off this mask and burn it. Um, but we are not through this pandemic yet. And we need everybody to come on board and come together to fight this common enemy, and to me, one of the greatest tragedies of the pandemic has been the politicization of a public health matter. Instead of coming forward, coming together as a community to fight a common enemy of the virus, we have divided into political camps, identifying ourselves by our usage or non-usage of masks. Can we let that go and set aside these differences to follow the recommendations of our scientists and our national experts to get through this, to minimize the transmission and to stop the spread of COVID. That is my plea. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Ms. Spear, Madam President. Yes. Um, if I may. Yes, of course, just Dr. Baca. Only because I don't want statistics to become truth when they're not. So I just want to be asked that you wait to see my presentation. I have the percentages. Um, it is not 50% and it's nowhere near that. So anyone who may have heard that, please don't go repeating that because you'll, you'll see what uh, I have in my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Baca. Yarden Tahan. Hi. Oh, flip this close. Hi, thank you. Um, I do wanna point out just because you said that, Dr. Baca, thank you for all speaking. I do know at our school, um, because I picked up the kids today, there were still people dropping off their forms with a big box right in the front of our school. So that one was in the office. It got moved from the, um, the curb where it was last week. Okay, so I'll just read what I wrote. Okay, I'm a little shaky because I'm a little mad. But I am here today as a parent of two Madison students, a community member who lives in the Madison School District, and a family physician who cares for our, for our neighborhood. My office is about a one-minute walk from here. So... Um, Thank you for recognizing that masks are important. They're the most important method for keeping our kids safe since most of them don't have any other option right now. And those kids who don't have any other option make up the largest amount of, the largest number in Madison School District. So as I said earlier, I'm just really angry about all of this. I can't believe we are still having this conversation. It blows my mind. Um, I think about all the things I do every day at work, how I come home, take off my stuff in the garage, how I make sure my kids are masked and I'm masked, 
how I don't do things that other people do because I know I have a responsibility to not only my family but to my patients who come in and ask me to care for them. And I've worked so hard and now the most dangerous thing I'm doing is sending my kids to school. My second grader came home today to tell me her teacher wasn't masked all day and it breaks my heart. <sighs> Masks work to help protect our kids and our staff and are universally recommended by literally everyone. Every single reputable source of health and science say that we should universally mask in schools. They mentioned all of them. There's no question. Opinions are opinions, but this is science, and this is a school and an education system where we're supposed to believe in science. I'm off topic, sorry. Okay. So as I said, this is not a matter of opinion or choice, and just as we expect our students to wear closed-toed shoes during PE for their safety, they should cover their face for their safety and for other people's safety. Because my daughter would love to come in her like high heel sandals, but she's not allowed to. The CDC, along with all reputable medical associations, recognize the only exceptions are for people under two or those with significant disability that precludes them from wearing masks. That's like severe developmental delay. I have, I have one patient who did not wear a mask this week when I saw her because she falls under those categories. Everyone else has to wear their mask whether they want to or not. There are no other acceptable reasons to not wear a mask in a building full of people who literally have no other options to protect themselves. Especially, again, when everyone is recommending this. The other thing I want to mention is I know some parents are going to talk to you about freedom and rights and how their kids have should, should have their freedoms to do things. I just want to say I agree with that. My kids have a right to go to school in person. They have a right to be safe. They have a right not to worry and come home scared. And they have a right to not be feared of quarantining, getting sick, or putting their grandma in the hospital. Thanks. Thank you. Catherine Chang. Hello everyone. My name is Catherine Chuang. I am a family physician and I'm about two weeks away from completing my master's in public health, which has been eye-opening during this pandemic, really. Um, and I also have twin boys who just started their first day of fourth grade at Madison Simus. While Madison students switched to online learning last year, I switched my practice to telehealth for pretty much a year. And every 15 minutes for almost a year, I talked to COVID patients. It was difficult work, but I was happy to do it because I felt my children were safe at home with me and Madison had their best interests at heart and would not bring them back to school until they were ready in March. And we did it. We did it really well, guys. I mean, I'm proud that we made it from March to May in person. I mean, that was a, a huge win for us. Um, and I'm just sad because I feel like hindsight should be 2020. Why, again, why are we having this conversation again? Um, we should not repeat the past year. We need to be prepared and we cannot bury our hands in the sand and hope that it's going to go away because COVID will not go away. It is here to stay. And it's really just simple. We should keep masking and we're already accustomed to it. Since March of 2019, we have been masking and we've done it okay. And Madison did it very well. And I'm not sure why, again, we're still having this conversation because we just need to continue it and we need to remove the ambiguity. We should have the universal masking and remove that exemption form. It is a small ask for such a big gain in our children's lives. Thank you. Thank you. And my apologies for not pronouncing your name correctly. Dr. Michelle Dubiz. And doctor, did I pronounce your name correctly? Ish? Pretty close. Okay. How do you, um, how do you pronounce your name? Uh, it's Dr. Michelle Dubes. Thank you. So I am a parent of a first grader at Madison Heights, and I am a physician. I'm a radiologist, to be specific. Unlike some of my colleagues, my braver colleagues here who treat uh, COVID patients directly, um, I have not treated them myself, but I've seen a lot of cases these past years. Um, any patient that comes to the ED, they're going to get a chest x-ray. Um, I've seen my very fair share of COVID pneumonias, and they're some of the worst pneumonias our specialty has seen. 
these pa patients come in short of breath, they get their chest x-ray, they get admitted, and then we follow them day by day, day by day, week by week, their pneumonias get worse and worse. I watch as they get intubated, I check their tracheostomy tube, I see when these patients develop clots in their lungs and their legs, I read their head CTs when they have strokes. It's a terrible disease. Over the past couple weeks, I've noticed a trend that the patients getting admitted to the ER with COVID pneumonias are younger and younger. These are 40s and 50 year old people. And I always check in their medical record for their vaccination status, and they're almost all unvaccinated. And I know this forum isn't about vaccinations, it's about masks, but the two things go hand in hand in a pandemic. And when I see these 40 and 50 year olds coming in with these horrible pneumonias unvaccinated, I, it elicits some responses in me. At first, I'm angry, and then I'm sad, and I'm frustrated. And I actually yell sometimes at my monitor, it doesn't have to be this way, and it doesn't. And I think about these 40 and 50 year olds, and a lot of people have different reasons for not following health guidelines and not getting vaccinated. And some of these people reason that they know their body best and they're making the right decision for themselves and for their family. And what devastates me is that I'm worrying that they're making the same, sometimes misinformed decisions for their family, including their children. Regarding children, we've already talked about the possibility of long hauler disease and multi-system inflammatory syndrome, but there's still a lot of unknowns. We know that the hepatitis viruses, they cause liver damage and they can lead to liver cancer. Hepatitis virus is the number one worldwide cause of liver cancer. We know that HPV, another virus, causes 90% of cervical cancers and anal cancers. We know that chickenpox virus can reactivate decades later as shingles. These are all viruses. This virus is new to us. We don't know the long-term effects. And children have the longest potential lives to live. I don't understand why we wouldn't do anything at all possible to keep them from getting this disease. Masks have been shown in a layered approach to work. And so I thank you for the decisions you've made previously and I hope we continue to fight for them. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes all of our calls to the public. Thank you to everyone who, who submitted them online and submit, was here in person and was able to speak. Thank you. Moving on to our consent uh, agenda, I will accept a motion to approve our consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Mr. Oz, um, Holcomb, seconded by Dr. Osborne. Please vote. <laughs> that motion passes unanimously. Moving on to information items. Dr. Baca, 7.1, status of data dashboards. Thank you, Madam President, members of the governing board and executive team. First, um, let me state it's good to put uh, faces with names. Uh, and I say that because we've, uh, for many of you, we've communicated um, with emails or uh, uh, some with uh, phone calls. And um, it's it's nice that we live uh, part of our strategic plan and our core values, which is an appreciation for the diversity of voices within our community. Before I begin, I also want to emphasize that I've also been in communication with those who may have an opposite point of view. And for those that I've spoken with on the phone, we've been able to have respectful conversations and um, understanding each other's points of view. Um, like many who spoke tonight, I applaud the decisions this governing board has made. I applaud our administration and, and our staff throughout uh, the district for all of their efforts to ensure that we're able to offer our students a safe, enjoyable learning environment and so that parents can feel as though their kids are safe and protected. In the past, we talked about safety in terms of active shooters, in terms of other types of tragedies that could take place. 
Um, before March 2020, we never realized that we'd be talking about a different type of safety. So tonight I want to do what we did when we started the pandemic is start to provide updates as a result of the increase in um, cases in COVID-19. As you know, the Arizona Department of Health Services and the Maricopa County Department of Public Health have continued to update their dashboards. And they do so based on recommendations with the CDC as much of their recommendations align with the Centers for Disease Control. Um, I think it's important for everyone to um, re be reminded that the governing board committed itself early on, as did the district, that we would follow the science and the recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control. We continue to do so to the fullest extent the law allows us to. Now, both the uh, ADHS and Maricopa County Department of Public Health report COVID cases per 100,000 and the positivity rates. For the state, they do so based on uh, the state and county areas. And for the county, uh, they do it based on city, school district, and zip codes. This governing board early on, because we have so many open enrolled students and staff that live throughout the city of Phoenix, decided to look at the measure based on uh, the city of Phoenix. So what do the current dashboards tell us? We're in high transmission when it comes to the county of Maricopa. Um, you see the cases per 100,000 as well as the positivity rate. Um, when it comes to the data dashboards this past August 5th, um, the transmission level within the city of Phoenix is high. You see the comparison of COVID-19 uh, cases, uh, 100,000 cases, um, and the percent positivity, and you see how much it's grown from the previous week. And then when you look at um, the May 27th through August 5th, I give that longitudinal perspective because look where we were when school ended. And if you see after the 4th of July, how it started to increase um, rapidly. As you can see, uh, blue means low transmission, uh, yellow is moderate, that orangey salmon tuck color is substantial, and high is in red. And for the last three reporting periods, when it comes to uh, cases per 100,000 and positivity rate, um, whether it's the county, city, or the Madison Elementary School District, er uh, district uh, area, uh, we've been in high transmission. And just one other thing on this. Now, um, it's not near the um, close to just over 800 that we were experiencing in January. Um, my hope is we don't get uh, there, um, but we just don't know exactly how high that's going to tick upward. So we're going to continue to post our data, our data dashboard on our website each time a positive case is reported. Since we no longer have concurrent learning, we're going to post cases that occurred on district property. Concentric uh, by Ginkgo is the batch testing that is now funded by the Maricopa County Department of Public Health. As you know, we were the first district in Arizona to pilot that. We uh, didn't have to pay for it. Uh, we're going to gear up to start that batch testing weekly again. Um, but the Maricopa County Department of Public Health will be paying for it and funding it. Um, we've been. They consulted us before they made that decision. Um, as various other states and uh, districts have, uh, Ginkgo has, has asked me to speak with them and consult them and as to how it works. I want to remind everyone the initial fear that batch testing was going to reveal a lot of positive cases and we were going to have to quarantine. The batch testing last year didn't produce a single um, test positive of those who participated. So we're going to encourage our families to continue to participate in that as it can mitigate a lot of the spread and need to um, do uh, quarantines or, or have outbreaks in our schools. When you look at a dashboard since August 1st up until yesterday, um, you see that we had seven total throughout the district. So you know that's not because of students. Those are all because of adults. As a matter of fact, today, because of the four cases reported since August 1st at Madison Heights, the county did declare an outbreak. That outbreak means that there are ties to those cases reported. They're able to make the link, and that's when they declare it. That doesn't mean the school closes. That doesn't mean it's because students were exposed. 
again, from August 1st to, 1st to yesterday is because of the adults that were present on campus. Some that were Madison Heights employees and others that were district employees. So what are the updated guidelines? While the guidance by the CDC and the health departments were updated near the end of the school year and in the summer, the only issue that has caused confusion and, and centers around face coverings. Not just confusion in terms of should we, shouldn't we vaccinated versus non-vaccinated, but it's brought up that debate of those who feel they're effective, those who feel they're not, or those who feel, as you've heard from Republic, that it somehow imposes on their, their freedoms. At this time, the CDC, ADHS, and Maricopa County Department of Public Health all recommend universal masking in schools, indoors, not outdoors, indoors, regardless of vaccination status. That vac regardless of vaccination status did change from over the summer. Where initially, it's only if you were not vaccinated, but now they're saying regardless of vaccination status. The challenge we had, because I think I know what the board would have supported and the direction we would have gone in terms of universal masking was the law that was passed at the end of the legislative session. So the court is hearing arguments regarding uh, the legislation that was passed that prohibits school districts uh, um, from requiring face coverings and that hearing is set for this Friday. Um, we'll see what the outcome of that hearing will be and how we can respond. As you know, we've been consulting our legal counsel in terms of what we are and are not able to do. Um, and I'll get into that in just a little bit when we talk about our mitigation plan. So we revised it first in July um, with an update on August 6th. And we took, had that update on August 6th to reflect the CDC recommendations centered around face coverings. The requirement for student staffs will be through September 29th until that law is enacted or until the court rules otherwise. We just don't know what the outcome of that court hearing will be. Per legal counsel advice, I think per legal counsel advice, let me first state, was no, you have to follow it. But if you were not to follow it, <laughs> um, you, have to, you, should have an, you have to have an opt-out provision uh, for students and staff. We aligned that opt-out provision for students with state vaccination requirement exemptions. In Arizona, those are very liberal uh, exemptions. It's based on medical um, condition. It's based on um, religious belief, and you can exempt based on personal belief. So let me just give you um, some statistics as of 2 p.m. today. What we um, have asked our health offices to do is to go ahead and empower school, um, put in the students who have opted out. We also are collecting information in terms of staff that have opted out. The purpose is so that we can keep track and so teachers can keep track of students whose parents have not opted out to make sure that they are, um, have a face cover and be able to um, not get after the students whose parents have opted out. I can tell you now, um, I've heard from four schools that say some parents they've heard from that even though they've opted out, they still want their kids to wear the face cover and it's just, uh, just in case they're caught without one, okay? So I first need to give you the enrollment so you understand how I calculated it. Um, Starting today, enrollment was 5,878 students enrolled, broken down by those campuses. That's an increase of 300 from when school ended, and it's about three, just, just under 300 um, ADM, which is different than enrollment, on the 40th day. In terms of those that are um, in pre-K, we have 379 students in our preschool program. As you know, we are not funded by the state for preschool, so that's why we separate them out. But if you were to add those together, we have a total of 6,257 students enrolled today in a Madison uh, school. We have 146 students on the wait list for our pre-K, and we have 341 MAC students on a wait list. So. Uh, we know how important that is to our families. Um, we're 
wanting to hire more and more of our MAC workers, and hopefully we can continue to work on that. So as of 2 o'clock, the face covering was by the numbers, based on students and staff. Overall, as a district, there are 4.63% families that have opted out of the face coverings. And for the entire district and staff, that's 3.64%. Uh, we do it based on percentage so it can give a perspective. So when you look at the number of students that have opted out, the most number of students whose families have opted them out is at Madison Traditional Academy. Now the reason why there is the star there is that's because the preschool program is at Madison Park. So uh, because they're physically there, we count those students in with Madison Park. Um, which is 10. If we did not do that, park students, there are four students who opted out, or 0.92%. So Madison Park Middle School has the lowest number of students who opted out, with the largest coming from MTA. But in regard to staff, MTA, although they have the highest percentage, they don't have any staff member that have opted out at this time. Although one of the preschool at Park opted out, so it's counted uh, as a Park opt-out, but actually the Park Middle School staff also haven't opted out. And up until this uh, 2 o'clock, just uh, later today, we did have a Camaview staff member who, who did opt out. So when you look at it in just in terms of those percentages by school, you see that at the highest it's 12%, just over 12% of students at one site and um, the low of 1.96% uh, at Park or 0.92% in the middle school. How that breaks out by grade level, you'll see there in terms of number and percentage. So um, the first grade classrooms across the district have the highest percentage of students who have opted out, um, which believe it or not, preschool, you have the fewest number of students who have opted out from um, the faced uh, requ covering requirement. Um, I'll just let you take some time to digest those numbers. So um, this would have been the big wave, I think, of those that may have um, taken that opportunity. Again, I even spoke with a concerned father about the face covering requirement who said, he he was going to send his child she did fine last year with it he just wanted it as an option he was a little bit more concerned about his other child i suggested to him he takes his cue um, from that person uh from, from his child um that young kids have been able to adapt to the face coverings um and so that's those are the types of conversations and email exchanges i've been having with some of our families with remote learning, we have 65 students in our kindergarten, first and second grade remote learning um, that's fully staffed uh, at this time. With Madison Virtual Academy, we have 141 uh, total students who are enrolled in our Madison Virtual Academy. So that's a total of 206 students who are learning remotely, K through 8. So the mitigation plan will be updated periodically throughout the school year. So for those uh, who have expressed to me, why does it keep changing? Um, my response is we update it periodically based on following the science and what is recommended by the CDC and our local health departments. We will continue to update and uh, uh, monitor positive cases and quarantine individuals per the Maricopa County Department of Public Health recommendations. Dr. Lomeli is in continuous communication with them and we continue to follow their guidelines when it comes to the need to quarantine. Because I know there's that concern about um, when a quarantine happens, how does this learning continue? I've asked principals to work with their staff ahead of time to inform students and families how learning will continue if students are exposed um, and need to quarantine. Um, we're talking about, and I talked with Ms. Marshall today, about utilizing our tutoring program for those students who are in quarantine so that our uh, staff can be have their stipend and check in on them um, live and over um, 
either Schoology or Google Meets and Google Classroom to be able to answer any questions, connect with them, and check in with them. I also remind uh, us all that if it's a 10-day quarantine, it doesn't have to be all the 10 days. Just a reminder that some of those 10 days are weekends, so it's not full school days, but we're very aware of um, the loss of learning that can take place as a result of that. And then finally, um, the, I have found the most effective, the most powerful tool that we can do, tool that we can all use, is for families to talk with families, um, moms to talk with moms and dads, and dads to talk with moms and dads in a respectful, informative way so that points of view can be shared and so that information can be shared and that we as a community can unite behind this public health crisis and do what is best for our students, our staff, and our entire community. So with that, I'm um, open to any questions or discussion you wish to have. Thank you very much. Ms. Kazi. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Lomeli. I don't think when she applied for this job or started working on home and human resources that contract tracing was going to be part of her job description. And the amount of time and effort she is putting into that is probably more than we will ever fully understand. So thank you for all your work on that. Secondly, I just want to, I know I've shared this with Dr. Baca, but I have a good friend that I work with who works for the Littleton Elementary School District out on the west side. They've been in school for two weeks as of tomorrow. And they had an emergency COVID meeting yesterday after school where they learned that 19 of their classrooms have already been quarantined. And those students are going to be moving to online and the teachers are going to be turned back to church teaching virtually. But more critically, um, students are going to be losing those specials that require them for, to move to a different classroom and mingle with students in other classes. And this is less than two weeks before the school year started. And so I am really frustrated. It just kind of blows my mind that we are in August of 2021, and we seem to have not really learned much in the last year and a half. As many of you know, my husband um, suffered a traumatic brain injury during the pandemic. And because of a, a issue of the amount of care that was mediated by other people in the hospital, the fact that he had a, a brain bleed wasn't detected until two months later when he had emergency brain surgery and now has, as a result, traumatic brain injury. And so he is you know, just one of the many people that has suffered because of the demand on the health system because of the COVID crisis. But what I have since learned since we have kind of encountered the world of TBI or traumatic brain injury is that um, I, was, I, I have started attending his rehab session family meetings. And I think last week we had 10 families present, including myself. And two of those families are there because of COVID. Their loved ones, in this case, both children, have a traumatic brain injury because of COVID. They had strokes or they have other issues that resulted in having some pretty neurological impacts. So I will tell you that given our, our entry into the world of the healthcare system, we have learned a great deal um, in a very scary and um, eye-opening way as the impacts of COVID that you don't fully appreciate. And so I guess I just don't understand why our staff numbers are so high. I just, I am really disappointed and frustrated because what this says to me is that either our staff don't fully understand or they understand and they've made a choice despite understanding. And I just hope that we do a little bit more in helping to educate them, that they are the leader in their classroom and students are watching what they do and they should be leading by example because we don't want to reach, first of all, we don't want kids to get sick, number one, and we don't want to go back to virtual learning. And I feel that if we don't do whatever it takes to get at least the masks on our staff, like that is the first step in helping, I think, other people that maybe at this point have decided that they don't think they need them to maybe question that. I don't know, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Ms. Gresham. Thank you, and I also want to thank um, everyone in the community that came tonight to speak um, and share their heartfelt comments and their personal stories. So thank you for that. And um, 
yeah, obviously we all thought this would not be happening right now. And um, I, I really hope that our kids can get vaccinated very soon. Um, and I worry about what happens after September when um, the law does go into effect. So um, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens there. I also think in addition to all these um, public health um, organizations, the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, also has recommended um, masking in schools. So uh, I do have a couple questions for Dr. Baca. For the batch testing, is the, um, what, do the parents need to fill out the form online again? Or how, is there a deadline for that or what? Ms. Gresham, Madam President, members of the governing board and executive team. Um, Ms. Um, Garvey is working on being able to do how we did it last time, which is send out the communication. Um, through PowerSchool, they have the ability to um, opt into that batch testing. Uh, we hoped we are able to get more families that are involved in that batch testing, especially when cases are so high, so that we're able to catch it um, sooner rather than later. As you know and you've heard from our public that um, there are many that are asymptomatic and this is one way of being able to curb the spread. Um, and so um, we'll get that up and going and, and Ms. Garvey will be communicating to that out to schools and we'll be doing that to our families with our families as well. Great, thank you. So yes, definitely look out for, be on the lookout for that. And um, as far as the opt-out form, is there a deadline? Would, did they have to have um, turned that in by today or what is there a deadline? At this point that? in time, there has not been a deadline per legal counsel. Okay, I also have some concerns about the opt-out form and um, uh, uh, originally it was gonna be, have to be turned in in person, but hearing that it was just a drop box or things like that is um, concerning to me as well. So I hope- If I can. may address that, Ms. Gresham. Please. I have, um, the minute I found out that there was the drop off box, which was all but, I'm told five minutes, it was removed immediately. Ms. Marshall communicated with all our health offices, all um, but one school was not doing it that way. Um, and so all I ask is that if that's the case, I need to hear about it so that we can rectify it immediately. And I apologize that that happened because that was not the intent and that was not my direction. Great, thank you. Um, I, think, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Osborne. Uh, in terms of the batch testing, is, is that mandatory for employees to participate? It is not. Can we? Um, uh, Dr. Osborne, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, I'll need to check with legal counsel in terms of the legal status of that. I, I doubt it, but I will follow through with our legal counsel. It, it seems like a very simple, uh, and to Ms. Kazi's point, um, with the employees not following the direction of the board, um, I think I'm troubled by that. And so I think we should consider a financial disincentive the law says we can't force them, but we can sure incentivize them and de-incentivize de them. And so that's something I want to explore. Okay. Same with vaccines as well. What I can do is when um, we have our next board meeting and I provide another update, um, I can provide you with that update as well. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. Mr. Holcomb. Yeah, thank you. I do want to thank all the community members who came and spoke. Um, I'm frustrated for different reasons, um, probably the same, but uh, you have much more. Um, it really bothers me when anything dealing with education starts to become a partisan issue. Um, education of our children is not partisan. Health and safety of our children is not partisan. Um, and I appreciate the, you know, the input we get from the community is very helpful. We don't do a polling though. What we really do is try to figure out what's right, what needs to be done and try to figure that out. Um, but I do very much appreciate the input that we've gotten. Um, I would like to, if, if I could, and I, uh, uh, if I could maybe put Ms. Rodriguez somewhat on the spot about talking after the first day, I mean, it seems like Park is having a, a fairly good compliance can you describe sort of what it was like with the, the, the first day with the uh, masking and the staff and, and the interaction? Sure, Mr. Holcomb, Madam President, uh, members of the governing board, Dr. Baca and executive team. Um, I'd say 
overall things were really smooth today. Um, you saw in the numbers there, um, even with the parents that filled out the waivers, we had some of those students still wearing masks. So um, the vast, vast majority of our students were wearing masks. And um, overall, I'd say it was just a really smooth day. Thank, and I'm and Dr. Bach, I'm not sure where this gets uh, the the proper place where this gets answered. But if a student or staff member who's not opted out does not have a mask, what happens? Thank you, Mr. Holcomb, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team. Um, as per our mitigation plan, the appropriate disciplinary action would be taken. It's progressive discipline in terms of our responses to. Um, any defiance of um, uh, of rules and and of behaviors that are expected. So and I'm, so if they are not have mask, we have mask available and we and we require that if they haven't opted out, even the numbers, any of them not opting out, if the numbers are small. Then the other students would all be required to have mask if they have not opted out. That is correct. We have in our uh, student information system. Um, the ability for teachers to know exactly which parents have um, signed the opt-out form and which have not, so that uh, they're able to easily identify those that should be wearing one, and if not, the appropriate uh, response would be given. What about for staff? Same for staff. Our principals and administrators, site administrators, have um, the form that shows them who has opted out and who sh um, uh, so they ha they have that list per school per site. So all administrators do. Um, so even at the district office, we have access to that information um, that we're able to know who is and who's not. And and I do need to commend the district office maintenance and transportation and substitutes, uh, where we only have three throughout and um, outside of the school, we have over 200 support staff. That includes 100 and some 131, I believe, substitutes. Um, so uh, I applaud their efforts as well. And I'm, I am concerned that the opt-out does, it, we do enforce the, the rules, and it sounds like that happened as we're getting used to it. You've enforced the rules that we put in place or that were put in place in mitigation for the opt-out. I am concerned that we really monitor that that does not get abused. Um, because I, I agree that we need to have as many people as possible in mask, and we do need to enforce it as a requirement. Um, and so, I part of our uh, I appreciate that we'll be getting those reports and that we will be responding um, that when people are not following that rule. And um, Mr. Holcomb, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, I will be happy at any time to have legal counsel meet with you uh, in executive session to provide further legal advice. If so if so desired. What, oh, one last thing, if I may, uh, Mr. And I think it's important for people to understand how our, how our mitigation plan goes forward. A lot of districts are voting on every piece of the, of the mitigation plan. And in, in what we've done is given you the authority to adapt the mitigation plan as, as things change so that we can be responsive. Um, I want to make sure that people understand that, that we, we have put that flexibility in so that we can be responsive as things happen. With one caveat, that it's in consultation with each of you individually um, before that happens. Yes, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to avoid no, the blame. Just, <laughs> I just want to make sure if you that. Want to blame, if you want to blame no. anyone for what happens, blame us, and, not him. And I know, but, and I, but, we, but yeah. the, the point was, we, we've tried to put this in so that we can be as responsive as possible. And Mr. Holcomb, my, the reason for that comment was simply because to say that we don't do anything in isolation. It's together, it's in consultation, it's thoughtful. Um, I always tell people I don't have the desire to be the first one out of the gate. I just want to make sure that we do it the right way. Um, I think that thinking things through, not reacting, but responding uh, when we're ready to is the best approach. And um, I know, Ms. Spear, you're going to have comments, but I, I do want to just highlight something that was highlighted today by Maricopa County Department of Public Health. And Dr. Lomeli, if you can please share with them what they said about Madison's contact tracing and the way in which we report cases. Thank you, Dr. Baca. Um, Madam my, President, uh, members of the Governing Board. Dr. Uh, Lomeli, a little bit closer. 
Madam President, members of the government board, executive team, uh, today I had a conversation with Maricopa County Department of Health, um, and it was in related to our um, system for contact tracing and reporting um, our p positive cases. And they pointed out to me that they, when they see Madison information come through, they quickly take our case because we do such a good job of our contract contact tracing and reporting all of our cases. So we're kind of a, an, an easy case for them because they, they really uh, applaud us for the hard work and um, the good work that we do. <clears throat> so that's a compliment to Dr. Lomeli and her staff for what they do and for um, all of our staff and, and their reporting procedures. Thank you very much. Dr. Osborne. Um, Dr. Baca, in designing our opt-out plan, it was my understanding that we designed it so that even after the September 29th deadline, we still have a legal plan because it is, we're giving parents an option, but we're still driving everyone, and so we can have a consistent mask policy throughout the school year. Sure, Dr. Osborne, right? Madam President, members of the Governor Board and Executive Team, I think the um, hearing uh, with the court will hopefully clarify that for us. I fear after that September 29th deadline um, what happens, but I think definitely we need to consider the continuation of that in order to extend it beyond if it gives, if it's within um, our legal ability to. I think that still needs to be decided and clarified by the courts. I also think that as a governing board and as a superintendent, we have a responsibility to determine if the cases are still high, what actions we wish to take. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to go ahead and share some of my comments. Um, I am hopeful that this is a wave. I am hopeful that with uh, the actions that we have taken, that we will be able to avoid some of the, sh the uh, quarantines and extended learning periods done virtually, which is ultimately what no one wants. These are extraordinary times. It requires extraordinary levels of cooperation to keep us all on task with this one goal that everyone has, which is to continue learning in person. I'm extraordinarily frustrated that we are obligated to even offer an opt-out. I've shared with you, Dr. Baca, that that is something that we have to do, and I, I, I don't like it at all. Because to me, it flies in the face of CDC guidance and American Academy of Pediatrics and every other reputable organization, medical organization out there, including all of the doctors that are sitting in this room. Uh, I agree with Dr. Osborne. I would like there to be some kind of incentiv incentivization. I come from a sales background. I am all for incenting our individuals, our, our own employees, to abide by what this board has put forth as a policy in the best interest of our students who cannot be vaccinated. It is beyond frustrating to see that number that high. I am, like all the other board members, like all of the parents in this room, incredibly frustrated that we're having this conversation at this point in time. Politics do not belong in education. It's one of the reasons I ran, to protect this board from, protect this one seat from ideologues on either side. So with that, I, I support, Dr. Baca, your efforts to continue this mask, not mask mandate, because we have an opt-out option, so it cannot be called a mandate, but to continue to uh, explore our options to incent our employees and to bring them along to understand. I had to get rapid tested yesterday because I was exposed by a teacher. I spent $100 to rapid test myself to make sure that my kid could actually go to school today. I was exposed by a teacher who was vaccinated. So I, you know, this, this is something that really does have a domino effect. And I myself am vaccinated, but that still doesn't negate the fact that I could actually have sent my kid to school with COVID, which obviously I don't wanna do. Anyway, thank you for your continued efforts. Thank you for your leadership. And you have my full support um, 
to explore some of the suggestions that Dr. Osborne had. And if I just may um, have one other thought that I'd like to share. Um, I think every parent has an expectation of their child's teacher in regards to the type of education they want, the type of classroom management they expect. And I think that they will fully express their desire in terms of what they expect from their teachers of keeping their students safe. And, and I know that. I, 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 I don't, I don't um, discount the fact that, they, that everybody wants the same thing, which is to stay in school and to keep our students safe. But facts are facts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I want to make sure that we um, rely on those as an educational institution. Ms. Spear, if I may have uh, one more comment or question. Of course. I just want to confirm, um, as far as uh, the buses go, that um, the masks are required on school buses. There is no opt-out for the school buses. That's correct for, it, for both staff, bus drivers, bus aides, and students. It is required under um, a federal mandate in terms of uh, public transportation. Thank you. And I, I want to make sure I'm clear. I was not exposed by a Madison teacher. I was a teacher in a different district. Thought that I should make sure that that was clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Moving on to superintendent uh, selection process 7.2, Dr. Baca. Thank you, Madam President, members of the governing board and executive team. As you know, you, um, I will be retiring at the end of the school year. Um, I felt it uh, was my responsibility to see us through uh, the crisis and I hope that by the time um, I leave that uh, we will be over this crisis. Um, so you had asked me to bring forward to you at this meeting a process by which you can follow in regards to recruiting and retaining uh, your next superintendent. The request for qualifications were sent out. Um, we wanted to do that in a timely manner. Uh, the method of approach, you can see the list there. Um, the, what I highlight in red is the ability for you to interview firms uh, before you select them. We did not go out for uh, quotes because we didn't want to select the one that was the lowest. Uh, we want you to have the ability to select the one that best meets uh, the needs of this district. That is going to have an impact in regard to possibly the timeline. Part of the qualifications uh, are beyond what is listed there is also the references that we've asked that they provide documents that list um, a minimum of three for references uh, for school districts they've worked within the last three years. I want to go back to one other one um, that talks about any consideration of what happens if a new superintendent leaves before competing one year, completing one year of service. What you're going to want to look for in that is a firm that says if um, the person we recruit a new hire only completes one year and then leaves, they're free of charge to do the next search. Okay. Um, administration will forward those RFQs to you. I'll forward them to you. They're um, going to be to us by August 19th. I'll do my best to get them to you that evening uh, for you to review prior to the August 24th board meeting. Per legal counsel, you cannot meet an executive session for discussion. You'll need to discuss and decide those in an open uh, that does make that decision in an open meeting. If you don't interview uh, the firms, August 24th could be the date that you select the firm, and then August 30th we have an all-day retreat, or I should say study session. That um, if the search firm is available, you can work with them on the timeline activities and so forth. It doesn't mean nothing happens in between. It's just I don't put that in because it depends on your desire and what the search firm recommends as to the activities that take place, such as a community forum, um, in-basket activities and the like that you'll see in just a moment. So in interviewing the firms, if you want to interview them, then you can look at August 24th as uh, the firms to be interviewed. And then on August 30th is when you can conduct those interviews or interview if you are looking um, at one or two or more firms. Then on the September 14th, you're able to um, meet in a regular governing board meeting to work with a search firm on timelines and activities. There would be action items on there because you would be providing direction as a board to the search firm as to what you want them to proceed in doing. And then either timeline, the goal is to have a final list. Remember, you select a final list that you enter into contract negotiations. Um, to approve the superintendent's contract on December 7th. The time
timeline that after you select the search firm, you're gonna to wanna to work with the firm to determine dates and times for in-basket activities, the selection of candidates to be interviewed, first interview, community forum, possible second interview, selection of finalists, and other things that uh, they may advise that uh, we haven't considered. And the firm should work hand in hand with the board, usually working with the board president uh, through the final contract negotiation. That's it, any questions? I will entertain questions from board members. Ozzy. Dr. Buck, can you, so can you walk me through if we do not interview the firms, what was your system? Yeah, if you don't interview the firms on August 24th um, is when you can take action. So you would review all the packets that are submitted to you as a board and then discuss it in an open meeting and vote as to which firm you wish to go with. And I assume that the regular protocol generally is that boards interview the firms. Can you give me some guidance on that? Um, Ms. Causey, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team, uh, each district does it differently. So some do interview and go through that process. Um, uh, others select them without an interview. Usually those districts that do that are because they're in a time crunch and they want to move forward with it sooner rather than later. If I may. Yes, of course, Mr. Holcomb. Um, the one time that, that, since I've been on the board, for one time we did utilize a, um, a firm. Uh, we did it by presentation. Uh, we uh, had them. The SBA is always, always one of those that presents. We chose a, a private firm partially because Chris Thomas, who was on the board, couldn't participate. And we did it for, off of presentation, not off of interview. Um, we rejected all of the candidates that that firm brought us um, and then hired uh, um, Dr. Ham based on a uh, dinner he had with Chris Thomas because he knew it and came back, interviewed, and that worked, you know, that, that part of it worked very well. And since then, we've used the superintendent directly to do it. Um, but I, you know, fully support the idea that we do a firm this time. Um, I think unless there's very, very clear, we have a lot of information that we do the, the interview process because it is very much a relationship, uh, you know, relationship based uh, engagement. And thank you for that clarification, Doc, uh, Mr. Holcomb. It is called an interview process, but really it is a presentation that, and that you can ask questions then based on their presentation. I do need to bring it to the board's attention that I will actually be calling into that meeting. I'll be taking my middle kid to college that day. I'll be moving him in, so I will be in Oregon. Um, so, Dr. Osborne, you will have the gavel, and I will be calling in on the 24th, correct? So, so let's walk through the logistics of it. Mm -hmm. If we were to do three presentations, because I think they would be virtual anyway, most likely, or they, it should be done in a way that the sphere you can easily participate. You know, I mean, I, I think that would be my recommendation. Or do we do like a study or a, a meeting before that, Let's do the and presentations, then, and then, and we could do that virtually, but still have it a public meeting like we did during the pandemic. I'm just trying to think of the easiest way to interview candidates. I assume some of them might be out of state or... Are we talking about the, the search, search firms? firms. Okay. Search firms, search firms. So if I may offer Dr. Osborne, Madam President, members of the board and executive team, I think it's uh, what I'm sensing is the desire possibly to move in the direction of the interview presentation of firms. If that were the case, then um, Ms. Spears' uh, absence because she said it's taking her middle child for his... I can't get out of the state. 18-year-old <laughs> to college. Um, it won't interfere with her having to remotely listen to the search firms because that wouldn't happen until the 30th. Remember, as a study session, that's during the day. So that offers a lot more flexibility probably and a lot more time for you to be able to uh, listen to presentations and interfere view in depth. So I assume we're going to get the packets, like a, uh, the, the actual RFQ responses, a week ahead of time to review them? You'll get it by the 19th or the 24th okay, for you so to select the firms perfect. or then you wish to interview. Are you going to give us some input to guide the decision making? Are you doing any? Can you give us just some guidance on that? What um, Ms. Causey, Madam President, members of the Governing Board, whatever it is you desire, 
uh, in terms of that input, um, but ultimately the decision will be yours, but I'll, I'll be happy to offer guidance and, and answer questions that you may have. Being that you are still um, here and have guided us through probably um, one of the largest crises this district has ever faced, and any district has ever, ever faced, I would appreciate your guidance, your, uh, your counsel. Ultimately, we do know that the decision lies with us, but your counsel is valued. So, so yes. Maybe a suggestion that we all kind of give some input through Dr. Baca mm -hmm. on kind of core questions, excuse me, that we need to ask. Um, <laughs> you know, that we would like him to, or at least the pre presenters mm -hmm. to present, you know, about and I, I have a very good friend of mine who leads a national recruiting and staffing firm, so I'm going to pick his brain. But you know, and Mr. Holcomb, I really appreciate what you wish you would have asked the last time, and you know those type of things. And um, and Dr. Osborne, Madam President, members of the board, if you look at the methods of our approach, you can expect that on this list here that uh, that should be included in their presentation. The questions you may wish to ask. Um, but most definitely, I'll, I'll be happy to supply um, recommendations for you in regard to what you should look for and, and the questions that can be asked. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from, for Dr. Buck on this item? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm asking of the board. I'm assuming then you wish to go to, with the timeline of interviewing firms or the 24th. Uh, you'll s select in a public meeting from the packets though all or some that you wish to interview and then uh, request that they be available on the 30th during the study session for you to be able to s hear their presentations and conduct interviews, am I correct? I believe so. And I believe that we'll be able, a, a firm will, will become the obvious choice through this process. Can, can I ask yes, one? Mr. Holcomb. So the timing question, my, my experience with this is, the recommendations can be critically important. Is that we're getting in on the 19th, and we're going to be selecting by the 24th. That's five days, you know, for the for the firms to be able to get the to confirm and contact their recommendations. What I'll be happy to do is, as the requests come in and those that we believe will be submitting, I can contact them ahead of time to make sure they mark the 30th of August off as to hold that date. No, I'm talking about recommendations from prior, when the interviewing firms, mm -hmm. one of the things on the RFQ is that they provide recommendations mm -hmm. of prior, you know, where they've provided prior districts. I found, you know, those recommendations can be critically important in trying to make that selection process decision on the 24th. Okay, so let me clarify. Okay. The references you're going to want are when you select your final firm. They will have submitted the references that are provided in terms of a list of contact information who we can contact. Right. And what we can do is um, either through Ms. Garvey's um, department or myself to be able to do that by the 24th for you to have. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Thank you. Dr. Osborne. But, but I think when we're checking the, we're, we're reaching out to board members at the, I mean, you reach out to the superintendent, hey, that was a great search yeah, firm, they right. picked me. Um, <laughs> um, so, I, you know, you may need to, especially Mr. Holcomb, who probably knows half the, if they've been here any time frame, probably <laughs> knows them, or Ms. Kaza, even Ms. Spear, um, if you need to rely on one of us to reach out to a, past board member one of their references mm -hmm. um, yeah. please you know, we can divide up that work and, and, and actually Dr. Osborne I would be concerned if they list the superintendent they promote it so um, if they use that person as a reference then that's <laughs> a cautionary flag <laughs> okay if there are any other questions if not if there are no other questions let me rephrase that then we will move on to action items Okay, moving on to action items 8.1, Arizona School Boards Association Delegate Assembly and the proposed political agenda. Who would like to take this item? Dr. Baca, would you like to introduce this sure. item? Thank you, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team. As you know, you have designated uh, Ms. Kazi to be the primary representative with Ms. Gresham as the alternate to be able to 
um, advocate for the political agenda that you proposed back in, I'm trying to remember what date that was, in May, I do believe, um, of this year. Um, and if you uh, recall, it's the four topics and you specifically wanted to get into um, some actual meat, <laughs> not the typical ones. So as a reminder, those are the four top priorities um, that you wish for them um, to uh, represent you on. So it's a recommended action is directing your delegate, Ms. Kazi, in alternate um, discretion to represent you and determine the position regarding the draft 2022 political agenda that you see before you. I will accept a motion. Oh. Yes, Mr. Holcomb. Yeah, um, Madam President, what normally we've, we've done is, is talk through things on the agenda um, and I our, both we, ours. Didn't we do this, uh, wasn't this direction. established? No, in, in the, if I could just, yes, in the Ms. past Kazi. we have not gone through their legislative committee report. We've never talked about that. We've always talked about what we're bringing to the discussion. Right. Because this is basically a rehash of what we talk about every single year at every single <laughs> ASBA legislative if committee you, meeting. If you feel comfortable that it, I do. this, this, this horse is dead, I've been on that committee, can... yeah, before. <laughs> I I know how this works. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. I have, I have faith in Ms. Kazi and Ms. Gresham's um, fortitude and um, their acumen in navigating the um, very interesting legislative or delegate assembly. So with that, I will accept a motion. Dr. Osborne? So moved. Excellent. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Dr. Osborne, seconded by Mr. Holcomb. Please vote. Madam Chairman, in a yes. point of my vote, <laughs> Scott and I tried valiantly one year to limit the agenda not to 7,284 issues, mm -hmm. none of which successfully get adopted, but we failed miserably, but you know, Ms. Kazi, please run up that um, up we, that hill and charge, and we'll buy you lunch for your. The Arizona efforts. School Board Assembly is not known for brevity. Um, I'll just leave it at that. That motion passes unanimously. I want to thank in advance Ms. Kazi and Ms. Gresham for your efforts and for your presence and for your representation of Madison. Moving on to future meetings, 9.1, Dr. Baca. Thank you, Madam President, members of the Governing Board and Executive Team. Um, we'll have some modification to our August 24th uh, proposed items there. Just a reminder, you'll have the second public hearing on a remote learning plan with action to follow um, and our action items. Uh, we will move approved search firm and add to approve firms to for interviews and presentations so that on um, August 30th during the board retreat study session, rather than candidate qualifications, you'll be uh, listening to presentations, uh, interviewing, asking questions, and then voting on the search firm you wish to go with. Back to August 24th, you'll have a first and second read of a policy I see that supports the remote learning. We have to modify um, the policy that uh, talks about instructional hours. And then, um, just as a reminder, starting on September 28th is when we will start meeting with our schools for their school reports. So mark your calendars ahead of time that we begin at 345 for those uh, school reports. Thank you very much. Are there any comments, questions with regarding future agendas? Okay, with that, I will accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Moved by Dr. Osborne, seconded by Ms. Kazi, please vote. That motion passes, thank you.